Okay, well, um, welcome. As, as Bree says, we're on, I guess, California time. Uh, although we all like to be a little five minutes late, you know, that's good. I'm very excited uh, that my friend and colleague, uh, Mega um, Ramaswamy is uh, presenting today. And um, she has uh, provided a very short bio, but she's got, uh, I could say lots of accolades about her, but I won't embarrass her too much. And I'll just, just stick with this short one, but she's a professor of population health, uh, University of Kansas School of Medicine. Um, and she's been working for a while on the intersection of urban living, race, class, and gender structure, uh, health and social risks for women and men uh, involved in the criminal legal system. And so uh, Mega has been charged with the task of uh, really talking about data collection and some of her harrowing experiences working uh, and collecting data uh, with and among folks who are just as involved. So Mega, go for it. The floor is yours. Well, thank you all so much for having me. I'm so happy to see so many friends here. Megan and Jennifer and Jordana are my collaborators. Um, it's great to be here. Nick is my new friend, but we've kind of known about each other for a long time. So um, I'm glad that we're formally working together now. Um, so I am not going to use slides. I'm just going to sort of tell you a series of data collection stories, kind of in chronological order. Um, and I think each of these data collection stories also goes with a funding story, which I kind of hesitated about because I know that's not the goal of this, not the promised goal of this session. But I kind of feel like, you know, what's the point if you don't get the money, how are you going to collect the data? So I'll just tell all of those stories together. So in 2009, I moved to, we love funding, yes, we all do. Um, I moved to Kansas City from New York City. So Jackie, I did a PhD at CUNY in sociology. And my plan when I first moved was to publish as much as possible from my dissertation research and from those data. In fact, my advisor said, do not collect your own data until you have tenure, which of course I didn't listen to, but I think that's good advice. I mean, his advice was, there are plenty of data around, you know, floating around in the universe, find someone who's collected a bunch of it. There are qualitative data and quantitative data and write papers from those data and move on with your life. Um, but of course I didn't listen. So in addition to publishing from those data, I thought, all right, I'm in Kansas City, who are the people doing this research? Um, so I had a bunch of lunches and breakfast with all of these people. And finally, my advisor in New York, I worked with, this, um, with Nick Freudenberg. He said, I have an old comrade in Kansas City. I think his wife worked in the jails in San Antonio. So I found this woman and we had this lovely lunch, Pat Kelly. She's retired now, but she was at um, the University of Missouri. So I work in Kansas. She was in Missouri, but our state line is like literally a small road. So five minutes away, we had this great lunch, we hit it off immediately. And she was senior at the time, she I think was a full professor and maybe like an associate dean of research, so a great mentor off the bat. And she said, listen, we just got to get into these jails and collect some needs assessment data. Megan has been telling me for years that a lot of this research has been on the coast. And we really don't know nothing about we don't know, any, we, we know little about sort of what's going on in these smaller Midwestern and southern cities. And also I'm a behavioral interventionist at my core and you can't really ask for money to do interventions if you don't know about your local population. So Pat's strategy was, I mean, at that lunch, she pulled out a notepad and was like, what kinds of questions do we wanna ask? And so we just threw together this survey with like very little preparation, which let me tell you was a mistake when we went to go publish those data. You have to like pay attention to your standardized instruments and your theoretical frameworks, none of which we did. Um, so we pulled together the survey, got IRB approval, and then we had to like get into these jails. So in Kansas City, there's three main jails. Um, for one of the jails, Pat just cold called some mid-level administrator, um, got them to agree to an in-person meeting. We brought breakfast. I think it was from Panera. This is very important. We always bring food or gifts. And we basically told them what they wanted to do. And they said, great, when do you want to come? And so then for the other jail, there was an administrative assistant in my office who knew me, liked me, knew that I did jail stuff. And she was like, hey, my husband's a deputy in Wyandotte County. Do you want an introduction? So she hooked us up with the special programs coordinator. We had a five minute meeting. We brought coffee mugs. So I have a steady supply of coffee mugs and baseball hats. 
um, that have our logo on them. We just got 500 more hats printed today. Um, I had to figure out Venmo to pay for them. So I had actually, I didn't have my own coffee mugs at the time. So I stole some from our graduate school office. <laughs> And we took them to Wyandotte County. We had this five minute meeting and she was like, great, you know, just tell me when you want to come and we'll make it happen. And for the third jail, this was our largest jail in the metro area. It was my first semester teaching and I had a state senator in one of my MPH classes. And she did not have my same political beliefs, um, but I think liked me and we've continued to be friends for 10 years. And she was like, let me introduce you to the sheriff. And they rolled the red carpet out for us um, and have continued to be collaborators. And we've worked in these three jails for the last 10 years, no problem. Um, and what I always sort of tell people is, I think folks have this feeling that A, it's hard to get into these kinds of facilities and B, the IRB stuff is a nightmare. But we just haven't found that to be true. I mean, these sit down meetings are key. Every time we have a new big project, we sit down with our IRB and we sort of talk everything through. I always have the belief, and so does my IRB, that you know their job at the IRB is to help us do what we need to do, you know, for the best science, for the thing that makes the most sense. And so we always come to some sort of agreement about what is the right approach. So anyway, we got IRB approval, got into these jails. I had graduate public health students. Pat had graduate nursing students. So for four months, we took about five, and I had a part-time GRA who ran my studies. Um, for four months, we took five people into the jails for about two days a week, four hours each day, and we would sit down and do these surveys. We interviewed 596 people um, over the four months with this needs assessment. We oversampled women, so it was half men, half women. And while we were doing this, I was sort of like paying attention to my academic surroundings, and this is the funding part of the story. And I was like, the big deal at Kansas is our cancer center. So because I was interested in sexual health, I thought, what is the cancer application of this? And I thought, all right, well, maybe cervical health. It turns out now I have this like massive cervical cancer research portfolio, but it was just a way to get internal funds. And I got this little cervical cancer grant. So that paid for part of this data collection. Um, the whole data collection, the cost was the students were working for credit. I had to pay my part-time graduate assistant, and then we paid $5 to each participant for their 15-minute survey, and we put that money on their commissary. Um, so I think it cost $3,000. And so I used my cancer money from my internal grant to do this study. And it was also my first grant, which you, know, you need one funding to get the next set of funding. And what we found in that first study was that like 15% of women said they got a pap screening. So this is the cervical cancer screening test um, in an emergency room, which we know is not possible. And so we kind of had this aha moment that we didn't really understand before, which is that maybe women are confusing a pelvic exam, which is a pretty routine experience. So about 75% of our women have gotten an STD screening in the last year um, with a pap test, which is the cervical screening test. And so we thought, oh my God, we have to, um, you know, dig a little bit deeper to understand like where is the women's sort of knowledge and literacy around these issues. So as a junior faculty member, you're often brought, I guess in the before COVID times, um, you know, you go to these dinners when visiting scholars are in town. So I was at one of these dinners with another sociologist, I could not remember his name um, for the life of me, but he was an AIDS historian. Um, and so, you know, you have to like give your spiel about what your research is about. And he said, oh, that's so interesting. He said, you know, I would be so interested to know if there is this difference between what the women believe is happening and what providers are actually telling them during these encounters. And I said, oh my God, that's it. So I wrote my first RO3, which is the smallest NIH mechanism. I think it's like $100,000 for two years. Um, I had gotten this great advice from a senior colleague who actually turned out not to be my friend. It's like the single person who didn't like me very much um, in my career at KU. But she gave me this great advice, which was, she said, the tradition in schools of medicine is to get people on K awards. So these are these NIH mechanisms that give you 75% funding for five years. They're great for clinicians because you can buy your time. But I'm a PhD and I had had a ton of great research training. So she was like, you know, if you want to be a sort of indentured servant, you can, you know, go this K route. But if you really want independence, just write one of these little RO3s, you'll get independence and you'll 
be on your way. And that's how she structured her career. And that is how I structured mine. So I took what this AIDS historian had told me and I wrote this little RO3 um, that the goal of which was to sort of understand how women were understanding their last pap screening experience. And then to go, ask permission to go into their medical record to see what the clinician wrote about that pap screening to see if there was agreement. And it was this tiny qualitative study. So we did focus groups with 40 women um, and then we did in-depth interviews with those women. And for a subsample, we went and asked for their medical records. And I remember we have this cabin in Alaska. So I took on the plane, all of the paper transcripts. Um, I still don't know how to do qualitative data analysis very well. I just printed them out, brought a highlighter and a pen, put them in a manila folder. And on the plane was like, you know, I think this is what people call open coding. <laughs> I'm like highlighting, right? In the thing, writing little words in the margins, writing all my codes on the back of the manila folder. Megan, is this how you legitimately do qualitative research? <laughs> and so then I sat there and I talked, I called my friend Pat Kelly and I was like, Pat, here are the codes that I found. She and both of us have public health training. I have a master's degree in public health, so does she. And she said to me, this sounds a lot like, you know, knowledge, belief, self-efficacy. And I was like, huh. So I started dumping quotes into those buckets. And then there was this fourth theme, which was sort of confidence navigating health systems. And this theme was particularly around the women talking about how if you go to the academic medical center where I work to the emergency room, you're definitely going to get arrested. And all of the sort of criminal legal discrimination women were facing in the healthcare system. So I identified these sort of four buckets, knowledge, belief, self-efficacy, and confidence navigating systems. And I remember I was sitting in this like lazy boy chair and I dumped those four themes into the structure of my first R01 grant. So I think, I mean, this is like the other funding story. I think people believe that when you're trying to design an intervention, you must write for an R21, which is like a smaller amount of money, but not so small, you can't do anything with it. I was told sort of early on that R21s are funded at such a low percentile, right? So at the NIH, you have to like meet a certain, like you have to get in the top percentile um, of the grants they review. So at NCI, the Cancer Institute where I get my funding, at the time, I think to get an R01, which is the big grant, you had to be within the ninth percentile, which is like nothing, right? And then for R21s, it had to be in the seventh percentile which is even less. And so I was like, forget it. I'm not writing one of these R21s. So I went straight for an R01. I did not pilot test this intervention, but I had these great qualitative data that for the grant application was able to sort of operationalize. Here's what the women said in one column around knowledge, belief, self-efficacy, and confidence. And then here's what this looks like in an intervention in the right column. Um, and so I guess my point around data collection to you is that women's words can be so powerful in both convincing reviewers to give you money, but also, you know, being able to like design a really good intervention that comes straight from what the women are saying. Um, and so that's how I got that first intervention grant. Now let me pause and think, is there anything else I want to tell you about that? Does anyone have any questions in the middle or you want to save them for the end? Okay, I'll keep going. Um, so I wrote for this R01, I got this intervention study. And so I, have, I was also told early in my career to workshop all of my ideas with my program officers. Now I've tried to get money from several institutes and I've never had luck outside of the NCI. Um, and I just think that not all program officers are equal, but the program officers at NCI are just fantastic. At every stage, at every grant, they have read my AIMS page. Sometimes they've read entire grant applications and given line for line feedback. And with this particular grant, the program officer told me two things. She said, one, this sounds a lot like health literacy. You should apply to this health literacy program announcement and you should talk about how this is a health literacy intervention. She gave me very specific language and I have always taken very careful notes based on what these program officers say and use exactly what they say in the grant application and it has never been wrong. Um, that has been my experience. And the second thing she said was, 
that I know this is going to go to a special emphasis panel. They're made up of anthropologists and sociologists. So by all means, A, use mixed methods research. They're going to totally get it. Do quant, do qual. And B, um, they are not going to care about a, a randomized control trial. So that's like the gold standard in interventions. But they sort of, she sort of said to me that they're going to believe and they're going to understand that you have a low risk maybe high reward intervention. I mean, it's just a behavioral intervention. It's like regular health, health education. She said, there's no reason to withhold this from half the women. So she said, find a study design, even if it's quasi experimental, that will allow you to deliver this to all of your sample. So I followed her exact advice, even though my reviewers, my, my friends said, oh, you gotta do the RCT. I just you know, followed the program officer's advice, um, got that study funded. So we implemented over, um, about two years, March 2014, I think, to sometime in 2016, a cervical health literacy intervention. This was the before time, so in person, in the jail. And what we did was we recruited women in 29 cohorts. So we would show up, um, I don't know, on a Friday. That was the day we went to the jails. And we went one jail, then we hit the second jail, then we hit the third jail, and then we'd cycle back around, you know, to sort of adjust with, to turnover. And I've always been interested in jails versus prisons because I sort of, I like this idea that women have lots of touch points with their communities. Um, you know, there's this moment in which they're incarcerated that you can, you know, do this intervention, this programming with them, and then hope that it has an impact on what, ha what happens when they're in the community actually seeking care. So we would rotate around these jails. So we'd show up on a Friday, we had a song and dance, me, my project director, Joy, and maybe one other student, and we'd say, hey, we're the she team, we call ourselves the sexual health empowerment team, we'd wear our hats that you know, say she on the front. And we wanna do this program with you. Um, so if you're interested, sign up with the CO um, or with your caseworker here, and then we're gonna be back Monday. So we would do that you know, every couple of weeks. And then when Monday came around, the CO or the case manager would have a list of anywhere from six to 20 women. And we would bring these women into a, either a library or a special programs room. And all the women would sit in a circle and they would both be bored, but also happy to not be bored in the cell. So, you know, like sort of questioning who we were, but also like kind of happy to be with us and doing something different. And at the time there were no iPads in the jail. Um, they gave us a little bit of pushback about bringing devices. So we very quickly gave up on the idea of electronic data collection. So we had paper and pencil forms. We couldn't use staples. <laughs> So we just had like this thick pad of paper that we hoped wouldn't like fly away and, you know, fall into a gutter. And we would sit around in a circle, do the informed consent, and then we'd have to do a baseline survey. And so, you know, half of women in our sample had not had a high school education. Um, so we would read every single question and every single answer aloud as the women did the survey. We would bring you know, anywhere from three to four study staff that way. And we would say, um, not to embarrass the women, we'd say, if you have a hard time seeing the form or want us to sit with you or can't hear properly or something, we'll sit with you and help do the survey with you. And that way, if women had a literacy problem, they wouldn't be embarrassed to say so. And, and we did have women that had vision problems that couldn't see the form. So we would sort of spread ourselves out as needed to help women do the survey. And then we had to randomize the women. So it was a quasi-experimental design. Um, this is too much information for you, but I'll just, it's part of the data collection story. And so we would assign women, it was a waitlist controlled design. And just depending on where they were sitting, it was very scientific. You know, person A would be in group one, the next person to group two, the next person group one, the next person group two. And we would see all, we'd start intervening right away, Monday through Friday with group one. And then we tell group two, we're gonna see you back next week, um, which of course they hated. And when we saw group two back next week and we, we did lose some, you know, jails or short-term facilities, women would leave, they would have court, random things would happen. Um, but I think, I think over time in that group B, we only had like a 20% attrition rate due to those other factors. So it worked out. Um, <clears throat> and then we do the intervention and we did, you know, these pre-post 
pre-post questionnaires um, at the beginning and the end of the intervention. And we took all of those paper forms. And at the time, my girlfriend, um, she was married to a guy um, who had this startup, it's called Captricity. And their technology was to take paper forms and turn them into electronic files. And I was their beta user. So they processed like a thousand surveys for us. Um, ran these through, send us back Excel files. The data were easy to use. Now, of course, we don't use them because they have these giant FDA contracts and we can't afford them anymore. And plus now we can like do better electronic data collection, but it was great. I mean, like we did what we needed to do in the field, which was paper and pencil surveys and found this technology that would allow us to, or I guess, prevent us from having to do all that crazy double data entry that I had to do when I was a research assistant. Um, so that was the first intervention. What we found in that intervention was that we increased cervical health literacy of the women um, and that they were also more likely to get screened after, a year after the intervention for you know, their pap screenings. So all of that was great. At this point, we had been with the women for three years and Joy, my project director and I, beloved Joy, we sort of looked at each other and we're like, we wanna be with these women forever. How can we do that? And so this is the sort of like data collection funding story. So I had been thinking about how can I be with these women forever? We have this great cohort, thanks to Joy and a crazy outreach game. And I'm happy to talk about the outreach that we did. We had like a 75% follow-up rate, you know, after two years. And that has continued um, thanks to Jordana's, oh, I, I don't wanna jump ahead. Now Jordana's involved in, in Oakland too. Um, so I was trying to figure out how to follow these women forever. We were in my third floor office at home. Pat Kelly, my old mentor was sitting at my desk. I was sitting across from her. And I was like, hmm, who are my best girlfriends all around the country that are also following cohorts of women with criminal legal system involvement? Who can we work with? And so I identified a friend in Alabama at UAB, Karen Cropsey, who I knew had a smoking R01 and was following women and men. And then I thought about my dear friend, Megan, who I had just met with Jennifer Lorvik, who's now also a dear friend. And I knew they had an R01 and were following women um, who were on probation. It turned out they were not all on probation, but at the time that's what I knew about the city. I just cared that we had these three geographically different locations, different policy environments, different sort of social environments where all of us were following women. And so Pat said, all right, you've identified these three friends, now what can we do with them? So we sort of thought, you know, there's this one sort of novelty of following a group of women with criminal legal system involvement. They're hard to find, we're already in, we're already following women, we've already built rapport. So that's, you know, one sort of big thing. And then the second big thing was like, we really don't know a lot about women's cervical cancer screening risks nor their screening trajectories. Um, so Pat said, why don't you sort of think through a theory about how to sort of understand that process? So I was walking in the woods near my house with my girlfriend who is an artist, she has nothing to do in the field, but I sort of talked through with her like, what are all the different factors here? and wrote a draft AIMS page. And so Jennifer Lorvik looked at it and she was like, just simplify this, just pick a theory. It doesn't matter what it is. And your AIM one will be, do the, does the women's behavior look like this theory? And so I followed her exact advice. She was right. We picked this behavioral model for vulnerable populations, um, which I can't remember what Jennifer says. It either is not great in analysis, but is great in sort of conceptualizing your study. I think that's what she says. So anyway, we got this grant. <laughs> that's it, Jennifer's nodding yes. Um, we got this grant to follow women in three different cities. And um, we had one in-person meeting in Kansas City. It was so great. It was like instant love among all of the team members from these three cities. And we got a year under our belt. We use REDCap data collection technology, um, which was something that we, I think, imposed on the Oakland group. The Birmingham group was already using it, but it allowed us to centralize in Kansas City um, so that we, all the data could be coming to one place. Jordana was great. She's the one who's running the study in the field and was like very quickly able to um, you know, to do all of the university and security stuff and actually use it with the women. Um, and we were doing pretty well. After year one, I think a 
across the sites, we had like, still like an 80% follow-up rate. It was amazing. And then COVID happened. Now, here's the thing that I didn't understand. I'm the kind of person who hires a really great staff and walks away from the project to like go do something else. So I had no idea how Joy was collecting the data, but it turns out that 90% of her surveys she was doing over the phone. So what happened is Joy is this like totally magnetic personality. In fact, we call what she has the Joy effect. And when we were doing the interventions in the jails, she was the lead health educator. And we quickly found that like the day or two after women got released, they would call Joy. They would save her number and they'd call her and they'd be like, hey, I'm out. I just wanted you to know. Um, we couldn't do anything. We're not social workers. We don't have jobs like to give people. We have no medical advice to give because we're not clinicians either. Um, Pat was a nurse, but apart from that, Joy and I couldn't do anything for women, but they just liked her and they just thought that she was like one positive person in their life and that they would just tell her they're out. And so she ended up getting these calls and text messages. And even though the women's addresses would change all the time, even though sometimes their phone numbers would change, Joy's phone number never changed and they would keep it. And so in sort of thinking about longitudinal study design, I was sort of brainstorming with Megan at the time, like how do you stick with the population for a long time? And she said, with her friends in San Francisco, they did these really effective um, monthly check-ins, quarterly check-ins. And Megan had said, even giving like socks was a really effective way to like get people in and then you could update their contact information. So we adopted a quarterly check-in. We paid women $10 for this. Um, and it was a really effective way to keep in touch with the women. And for us to like remember that we were around, for them to remember Joy. And because of this rapport that Joy had built, you know, it turned out and, and also understanding that women not only use their phones and find a way to call her, but also we started a Facebook group, a closed Facebook group. Um, that Joy monitors heavily. At first she had a picture of herself and then started getting all of these weird solicitations and then she removed it and put like a flower or a logo or something. Um, but the Facebook group has been great. I think like 70% of our women are on in our Facebook group. So if they weren't checking in with her on the phone, they were private messaging her, you know, over the years of doing the study. And I, I would love at the end of this for Jordana to say how she kept in touch with her women. I know they had a field site pre-COVID that was pretty helpful, but Jordana, if you would talk about that at the end, that'd be great. Um, so Joy was on the phone with 90% of these women. So when the pandemic hit, it was really not a problem. I mean, I think across the three sites, we've been consistently collecting Tri-City data. Um, and we've always paid our women for our studies. In Kansas City and Birmingham, we were paying the women with these CLIN cards that some of you might be used to. They're like debit cards and you can upload from afar money onto the debit card, no problem. Jordana though was running an all cash business because that's how they'd always done it. And so she can also tell you about the difficulty of in a pandemic finding FedEx envelopes and sending it to women. Um, who, by the way, have like very sort of marginal housing situations. So you can't like, you know, it's hard to FedEx to, for people who don't have one steady place they live. But um, I would love to hear Jordan tell you about how she managed that. So I think we've managed over the pandemic in Tri-City like really excellent follow-up rates. About one month into the pandemic, this was a year ago, last April, all of us started independently panicking about the women we work with. Um, you know, were they going to be safe? Were they going to keep whatever marginal employment they had? Like, you know, what was going to happen to them? We were panicking about our own families. And as, so I said um, to the team, I was like, let's just start calling the participants, which P.S. Jordana and Alex in Birmingham were doing anyway, just randomly calling to check on people to see how they were doing. And I said, let's formalize this a little bit, collect some data around it. And then Jordana and Joy tell me, not only were they calling to check in on people, but the women were calling them to check on them. Hey, Jordana, are you okay? Are your kids at home? Stay safe. Um, I mean, this was happening on all three sites. So as much as we were calling the women, they were calling us to check on us to make sure that we were okay. Um, so we did this like tiny little qualitative over the phone data collection about how the women were faring in the pandemic um, and wrote about it, got it published and that was our first Tri-City paper. Okay, so that's that data collection story. Um, 
Oh, so in the meantime, we had this um, effective cervical health literacy program. Let me just make sure in the chat. Um, who's your mentor, Lauren? Uh, Karen Cropsey? Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. <laughs> um, so in the meantime, I, you know, I hate the idea that we get millions of dollars to do interventions, we do them and then they die. Like you don't do anything else with them. So I was not gonna let that cervical cancer intervention that was effective, you know, be for nothing. So I thought, what can I do with this? And I, I sort of felt like I had this obligation to write the next intervention. Um, and so I did. So we learned a couple of things from that study that we implemented in the jails. One, what I've already said, that many of our women were on Facebook with us, that we had this excellent follow-up with women, that we could keep in touch with them on their phones. We also did a little bit of data collection about the nature of their phones. Many of them actually had a smartphone, I think like 70%, so they could do like, you know, web applications and we're checking the internet and their social media. The other thing we found while implementing a cervical cancer intervention is, of course, hello, women don't just care about their cervixes, cervices, whatever the plural is of that word, but they, you know, they think about sort of broader women's health. So I ended up writing for a competitive renewal of my R1 to do a broader women's health intervention. So cervix, breast, it all had to be funded by the Cancer Institute. So there had to be some cancer stuff in there. Um, cervix, breast, uh, STD prevention and reproductive goal planning. So like birth control stuff, prenatal care stuff. Um, and not only was it gonna be this broader women's health intervention, but we were gonna move it to an M Health platform. Because what we realized is that women may be marginally housed and underemployed, but they all had cell phones and they were all sort of connected in that way. So we thought we could do this mobile intervention. And my program officer said she had not had a single competitive renewal in her portfolio, but she said her father-in-law was like a microbiologist and he kept like, you know, writing these competitive renewals one after the other and then funded like 20 years of his research. So she said, based on my father-in-law, I can tell you, here's what you need to be successful. You need to say what you learned and make a very clear connection between how what you learned is gonna inform the next project. I mean, that's what we're all supposed to be doing in our grant proposals anyway. And then she said, it's very important that you are clear about your success and success is measured in these competitive renewals with the number of publications you have. And I'm happy to talk about a publication strategy, but we had a, a large number of publications that we could put in our publication list and I got this intervention funded on the first round. So we have this M Health intervention. It's not only is the intervention electronic, but we've you know become more technologically savvy ourselves, and all of the data collection is electronic because we're doing this in the pandemic. It's all over the phone. We were supposed to be recruiting in the jails as women were leaving, which is a thing we've done before. So I had my second project director he would stand outside the jail. We knew women were released from between like two in the afternoon and four in the afternoon. And he would just stand outside and find them. And he'd interview like, you know, three people an afternoon. That was a little pilot study I did. And that worked. So that's what we were gonna do in this study. But, you know, we couldn't do any of that in the pandemic. The jails wouldn't let us anywhere near them. We didn't wanna be anywhere near the jails. Um, so our program officer, we sort of approached her and said, hey, could we try snowball sampling? Um, and so we ended up snowball sampling for the study. The first group of women we went to were our old sheep participants, which now we've been with for seven years. So Joy has known these women for seven years. Um, and I have a whole ethnographic data collection story that we're probably gonna, it's very fun. Um, I'll, I'll make, I'll, I'm gonna wrap up this story real quick and tell you a little bit about that. Um, and so we went to the sheep participants first and said, you can't participate in this, because they were in the other Tri-City study. So we didn't want to intervene with women we were following for another study. Um, we said, but if you have a friend, we will pay you for the referral. So I have a girlfriend in New York City that works with sex workers who are adults, sex workers who are not adults, gang members, drug dealers, and she does snowball sampling all the time. She has this very complex method for paying for referrals, tracking those referrals. So we adopted her protocol and we, allow women to make up to three referrals. We pay them $10 for our referral. 
And one of the women ended up posting the study on a group. It's like a private Facebook group for formerly incarcerated women in Kansas. And we've gotten 67 participants from that referral um, from this Facebook group. We have tried, so um, Sarah and I were talking about social media and using social media. We have tried like posting our recruitment flyers on social media for like the nonprofits we work with, nothing. We have put flyers um, in every mailbox um, of every jail, like, you know, in a 200 mile radius, we've gotten one participant that way. But every time a participant posts about our study on her personal Facebook group, we get lots of people. So it's like, you know, my program officer said when we were writing the M Help intervention, she was like, you know, I, she's a social media expert. She was like, I see these interventions all the time. And the one thing we're missing is, remember I said the joy effect, which is how well joy built before with participants. We never measure the importance of human interaction in these interventions. So with my M Help intervention, I have a third aim measuring the joy effect, essentially, measuring what the role of human interaction is. Do women private message us? Do they call us on the phone? Do they wanna talk more? Are they posting testimonials onto the webpage? But I think also this recruitment strategy has also illustrated that even if it's in social media, it's the warm handoff that's everything. You know, you can't just like have the, one of the journeys to new life is one of the shelters that posted our recruitment flyer on their social media. We haven't gotten anything. I mean, I think that is like not the warm handoff. It's another woman saying, hey, these girls are legit. Would you call them? Um, that's always worked for us. Okay. <clears throat> so I want to tell you in like, yes, I can send whatever you want. You can just email me. I'll put my email in the chat. I can send you funded grant applications, protocols, whatever you want. I am happy to share. Um, in all of these studies, <clears throat> I've always had sort of a qualitative component. In the SHE study, that first cervical cancer intervention, the first aim was to see like, does the intervention work? The second aim was to see, because I'd grown up around Megan, like, well, like how does women's health unfold in the context of their everyday lives? And I had been trained um, at CUNY by the sociologist, Mitch Denier. He's an urban ethnographer. And so, I mean, always like, I like to read ethnography more than anything else. Like I hate to read peer reviewed quantitative articles, which is why I don't know the literature <laughs> at all. Um, but I love to read urban ethnography. So I'd sort of been trained in this method, um, was familiar with Megan's work, knew Megan. And so Megan helped me write this ethnographic protocol and so for seven years, we've been, and when I say we, I really mean Joy and another ARCH member, Amanda Emerson, who has one of your small grants. Joy and Amanda and I have been following about 15 women for seven years, very closely. Um, and we made this beautiful ethnographic data collection protocol that was based a lot on Megan's experience, sort of what I knew from reading all the books, um, and I mean, we had things like, who's going to be the attorney we call if we get, you know, arrested? Like, what kind of illegal activity can we engage in without getting in real serious trouble? Like, how, what's going to be the excuse when we need to leave a place because it's getting dangerous? I mean, it's this beautiful protocol um, because the truth was that we spent a lot of time in our cars, in the streets, like getting women as they're like trying to find customers to sell sex, like to come sit in our car for 10 minutes to talk about what's going on. Um, and so we would see women with these 15 women in the beginning, we would probably see them every other month. Now we maybe talk to the women twice a year. And every time there's a global crisis, <laughs> presidential election, <laughs> the pandemic, summer, um, it gets really hot in Kansas. You know, we call all the women and check on them, try to see them. Um, Joy, you know, routinely gets phone calls about, you know, whatever hard time the women are going through. Also good times, she gets phone calls about babies that are being born, grandbabies and daughters um, and sons. And so have been able to keep in touch with the women through a mix of seeing them in the street, visiting them in jails if they get reincarcerated. Um, doing formal interviews. So Amanda for her PhD dissertation, and I don't know if you know this about Amanda, but she also has a PhD in English from Brown. 
is her second career. Um, so she wrote her PhD dissertation based on these data. She did formal interviews. They were beautiful. So because she has a PhD in English, she's not here today, um, so she won't be embarrassed by this. She had this idea to get the women to tell us their life stories. And so she would say to the women, if your life was a book and each chapter was about an important relationship in your life, tell me about the first chapter. And then the women would tell like, usually often a pretty traumatic childhood story. And then she would say, all right, for the second chapter, tell me about the first significant romantic relationship you have, right? And then we go, we go, we go. And at the end, Amanda would say, if you had to give a name for your book, what would the name of that book be? I mean, they were just beautiful interviews. It was this like gorgeous narrative methodology that I could have never dreamed up, but because she was an English professor in her former life, had dreamed this up. Um, and she's got great papers out there, um, <clears throat> which I'm happy to send to you, Amanda Emerson about this work. And so what we would do in the field, of course, we'd say, hey, can we record our conversation? And I, you know, several times in my car, um, we have our favorite participant, Sarah, her fake name, she would say, all right, you have to turn off the recorder for this part. <laughs> so we turn off the recorder, she'd tell us some secrets, and then we turn the recorder back on. And then as soon as we, um, you know, drop the women off or be done, we would record field notes. Um, and because it was just too hard for us to get back to our offices, because it's all of this is so exhausting. Um, you know, being in the field is just so exhausting. And so we would be too tired to type notes. We just record the notes, get them transcribed. Getting data transcribed is like an ongoing battle for us. I mean, it's like, it takes forever. Um, <clears throat> and anyway, all right. So. I'm getting the cue to start taking questions from Sarah. Yeah, I, I was gonna say I, I was gonna interrupt. I, although you are, you have us all mesmerized, and you could probably go on for quite a while, and <laughs> we would love it. But for the sake of giving uh, our audience uh, some opportunities to ask you some questions, um, wanted to open it up. Um, feel free to post a question in the chat or. Um, Unmute yourself. Um, I love this idea that you, um, it's, I mean, it's, it's more than an idea, but uh, this maxim that you imparted to us, which is use people's words to make clear what's important to study. And um, I think many researchers in academia struggle with that. And you know, there are different ways to do that. And there are different things you can do with ethnographic research, obviously. And some of it is to publish, 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 which you need to do. But I think that that's a very just profound maxim to, to live by, which is even if you are not using people as a community advisory board formally, to, to search in their answers for the things that need more, more questions from us. You know that they're giving you answers about the problems, and and we need to keep asking more questions to get more answers. And um, I just I just love that. I love I love that you said that in the beginning. So thank you for that. That's what I'm going to take away from this. Absolutely. I wish Joy was here. I you know I hope you get the sense that we love these women so much, um, and that has really sort of driven anything. Like we, you know, I think on our team, we have close relationships with the women who are on our team, the investigators and the students. Um, but we also have close relationships with the participants, which I realize is like somewhat probably problematic. Um, but, you know, we're clear about what our relationships are. Um, we try to be in our papers and sort of how we've negotiated these relationships. Um, just as a shout out to Arch, I loved a presentation you had a couple months ago from the researcher who had a community advisory board and loved it so Margo. much, mm -hmm. Margo, that we immediately went back and started doing some strategic planning on our end. And Joy, my project director, is going for a PhD, which is very exciting. So for her diversity supplement, have just written to develop a participant, participatory action research project to like really formalize, you know, the work with participants as part of the research process. And that would be a new frontier for me. I know, you know, it sounds like we wanna work with the women and we're really using their voices, but I have never been a good CDPR researcher at all. Um, so this would be like the first step in that process. 
That is such wonderful news. That is music to our ears. And we're going to take that quote and put it in our renewal. <laughs> How's that sound, Megan? Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I see Lauren uh, had her hand up. So go, go ahead, Lauren. Yeah, um, I was starting to type in the chat that it's very clear that you think of them as more than participants, um, but still an appropriate way. And that was very like warming and um, uh, a great way to look at it. And I was starting to think about CBPR and I was going to ask, have the women influenced many of your kind of research questions or directions? You all have very rich conversations with them. So I was wondering how much of it is reciprocal. It looks like you all are going that way if you, if there is gonna to start to be CBPR. Yeah, when I first got my job, there were great CBPR researchers in my department. And I was like, this is taking forever. I'm a very impatient person. Um, so I was like, I can't, I can't like start from the community in the way that these excellent researchers were. But I feel like my approach to science is like, let the data tell you the story. You know, I'm very strategic in that I'm going to write grants that I know I'll get funded, right? Um, so that's sort of my, I guess, constraint. But I think it's also like also being strategic. Um, so to the extent possible, I'm going to go use the best data collection method to answer the question and then really look at those data carefully and say, what did these data tell me about the next set of questions? So, I mean, that is not what CDPR is, but I think it is like just really paying attention to what your data tell you. And the extent to which those are the women's voices, they are. I mean, qualitative data collection will allow you to capture voices, but I think any data tell you a story. Can I hop in with a question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then after, and then Megan also had her hand up, so. Oh, I'm sorry, I'll wait, I can wait, so I'm just like rudely jumping in, but you just, oh, said, yeah, you just said something that I think um, captured my attention because I'm writing my first R01 now. You said, I only submit grants that I know will get funded. As you were a newer investigator, what were the things that, I know Bree's great at this too, but what, what are the things that you're like, these are the things that I know, or like, this is how I view a grant? To think about it from that angle because clearly you've been successful at getting grants funded so it's all about telling a story um the first paragraph of your aims page the first paragraph the first three paragraphs of your significant section um you know like really capturing the hearts and minds of the reviewers because if you capture their hearts and minds they're less critical when they get to the methods bit <laughs> but even for the methods like simple elegant clean um, the, I think the data success, the preliminary study, the way to form your prelim preliminary study section in a grant proposal is to like, again, tell a story. Um, so, you know, you say, I did this research project over here. I found these three things, but it raised this one question, right? And we don't know from the literature what the answer to that question is. So this new grant addresses that question. And I'm happy to, I think actually one of my R01s is up on the, on the NIH, like for public download. And you can sort of see how to tell that story in a preliminary study section. But it's not about, you know, impressing the reviewers with your team when you write a preliminary study section. It's about really telling a data story. This is what we found. This is what the literature tells us. This is what remains to be known. And this is how I'm going to answer that remains to be known domain. Does that help? And I think also just like, you know, you want the blessing if you can get it of the program officer. Um, not every institute will give that um, kind of feedback, but I, you know, it's, I, um, I feel better when the program officers have given feedback and I followed their advice. The other thing is try to get yourself on a study section. There's an early reviewer program um, that you can apply to because I you learn so much when you see how these grants are actually reviewed. If you, whenever I try to give feedback to um, other people on their grants, I read them as a reviewer and score them according to the reviewer criteria because they have to write these summaries under you know significance, innovation. There are prompts around significance and innovation that I think are publicly available. So, for example, for significance, it's something like you know, is this, um, 
do they do they talk about what is known and the rigor of previous research, right? Like, is the previous research in the field good? For overall impact, the definition of that, is this gonna exert a powerful and sustained influence on the field? And so you have to ask yourself that question when you're reviewing your own grant. Have you convinced them? And sometimes you got, I think every time you got to spell it out for the reviewers. This study will exert a powerful and sustained influence on the field because X, X, X. That way they can just copy and paste in their review. Megan, I, I know you had your hand up. I want to give you a chance. I know we only have a couple more minutes left. Yeah, I was just curious. Um, I'm really interested in the Facebook chats or a group that you formed at, as part of your method. Could you talk a little bit more about kind of how you got that going and if any issues with IRB came up, um, if you had to kind of explain, you know, how you would protect those conversations and things like that? Yeah, so um, we struggled. We had to figure out first how to get all the privacy settings on lock. Joy, who maintains one of our Facebook groups, has to um, make sure it's really the woman who's trying to come in and not some controlling boyfriend or someone else. Um, so she'll like, you know, ask some questions, try to feel it out. Um, the way we got around it with our IRB was we don't collect data through Facebook. So we only use it as a way to keep in touch with the women. And so the IRB was more forgiving about that. I think they only have like serious concerns when you're collecting data and personal health information might be shared, but to just like keep in touch with the women, it's not a big deal. Um, if you email me, I can send you the way our IRB application and our protocol reads for the IRB around Facebook. And we, ha we just published a paper too on how Facebook engagement is correlated with higher follow-up rates. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want, just want to say thank you again, Mega. This was really a pleasure. Um, and it, it was great, you know, without, with no slides. I, I appreciated that. I thought it was very engaging. Um, really so thankful. Um, I think we all um, take our hats off to all the great work that you and your team are doing. And so we really appreciate you taking some time to, to talk with us today. Well, thank you for having me.